Welcome, everyone. Um, I am Abby Stockwell with Department of Ecology, and I will be moderating this session, um, Alternatives Ass Assessment and Six PPD Alternatives by Craig Manahan, also with Ecology. Please type your questions um, into the chat, and we'll be able to answer them at the end. Thank you. And take it away, Craig. Thank you, Abby, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, my name is Craig Manahan. I'm a chemist at Washington Ecology in the Hazardous Waste and Toxics Reduction Program. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about how we look at alternatives, uh, specifically in relation to the 6-PPD and tire anti-ozonants. So if you're in this session, you're, you're likely familiar with urban runoff mortality syndrome. Uh, Stephanie Blair just talked about it in the last session, and Jen McIntyre will be talking about uh, her research um, tomorrow morning as the keynote. Uh, however, here's a quick summary just in case you aren't familiar. Uh, so, urban runoff mortality syndrome, also called ERMS or pre spawn mortality, is when coho salmon die in urban streams before spawning during the fall migration. And symptoms include lethargy and loss of equilibrium, and it can be caused by roadway runoff, runoff alone. So this syndrome has been investigated for over 10 years or so, but the exact pollutants in stormwater that cause it had not been identified uh, until last year in December 20. Researchers uh, from UW and WSU, among others, published a paper in the journal Science identifying 6-PPD quinone as being responsible for URMS. 6-PPD uh, is an anti-degradant used in automobile tires, and when it is exposed to ozone, the quinone form is formed, and you can see that reaction in the middle there. And this compound alone caused mortality in coho uh, with the same symptoms and an LC50 of about 0.8 micrograms per liter. Um, and this uh, matched the concentration in stormwater samples and tire leachate, which were known to cause URMS uh, with a very similar LC50. So now that we know that URMS is caused by 6-PPD and 6-PPD quinone, from tires, the question is, what are our next steps as Washington Ecology, as a state, and as from the tire industry's perspective? Some people would say that we should immediately ban 6-PPD in tires to reduce the risk to salmon. Uh, some other people should say that we need to do a risk assessment to quantify what this risk is exactly. Um, and at Washington Ecology and our program, Hazardous Waste and Toxic Reduction, we deal with similar types of problem in our work um, where we look at hazardous chemicals in products. And we use a process called alternatives assessment and course reduction to, to help reduce um, the risk there. So I'm gonna give a quick overview about this process and how we are going on with that in tires. So one of the main tenets about how we approach and products is that source reduction is the most preferable method of managing hazardous chemicals. Risk is generally thought of as a combination of hazard and exposure. And you can reduce risk by uh, limiting exposure, but we think that that is a less desirable outcome than reducing hazard because it leaves a lot of room for error. If you reduce exposure from one scenario, um, like during its use as a product, then you still have it around as a hazardous chemical during manufacturing and during end of life. And so sort of we advocate source reduction, reducing the use of a hazardous chemical by switching to a safer chemical um, by design. If there's a less hazardous chemical that is able to do the same job as the more hazardous chemical, then from a risk management point of view, why wouldn't you want to switch to it? And that's what we're trying to promote. Um, so a little bit more on that here. This, this approach helps us avoid unintended consequences across the entire life, life cycle of consumer products. 
And so that can be from the beginning of life during manufacturing, it could be during product use, and it could be during end of life. So you don't have to worry about all the different exposure routes and preventing exposure. If you just switch it out, then you reduce risks across the life cycle of the product. Avoid those consequences to workers, consumers, the environment, et cetera. Um, so one way, the sort of the method we use to go about this is by using um, a process called alternatives assessment. And uh, the process is outlined in this guide by the uh, IC2, the Interstate Chemicals Council. The IC2 is a coalition of state, local, and tribal governments. And they created this guide, which contains modules to assess hazard, exposure, performance, and cost availability of potential alternatives. So we can look at an alternative and use this guide. And this way, it's sort of a repeatable process that is sort of laid out. How exactly are you assessing hazards? How are you assessing performance of a potential alternative um, to make sure that you're finding something that is safer and it meets all the performance requirements needed in the product? And we're using this sort of method in a, um, in a program at Washington Ecology called Safer Products for Washington, where we work in collaboration with Washington um, Health to um, potentially remove uh, hazardous chemicals from consumer products. So this is a four phase process. Um, uh, the bill was signed into law in 2019. And the, we have uh, the first phase where we define chemicals that we're worried about, the second phase where we define what consumer products contain these chemicals. The third phase where we determine whether we want to require notice, restrict a chemical or take no action. And then uh, phase four, where we perform rulemaking to sign those regulations into law. Um, so in 2019, the legislature defined the first chemical classes for us. They are PFAS, PCBs, phthalates, phenols, and flame retardants. And then in phase two, we define products that contain these chemicals. And then right now we're in phase three where we're deciding what we wanna do with those using this alternatives assessment guide. So we're looking to see if there are alternatives to PFAS in um, carpet, for example, that are safer and get the same performance requirements as PFAS, then we could potentially restrict PFAS in carpets. And so I'm bringing this up because this is a potential route with which we could um, look at 6PPD in tires. Um, but we won't be able to define 6PPD until the next phase of our Safer Products for Washington program, which won't be until 2024. And then also the law says that we cannot define priority products, which are including automobiles. And so it's sort of a question whether these tires would really um, be allowed under, under this law. <clears throat> Another program um, that could look at this is uh, in California, the Safer Consumer Products Program which is part of the uh, Department of Toxic and Sub Toxic Substances Control. Um, and so they have already designated motor vehicle tires as a proposed priority product, but zinc is the priority chemical that they, that they find there. So discussed adding 6PPD in some documents and it's on their list of potential candidate chemicals. Uh, the stakeholder discussion draft uh, listed there. And so if they added 60 tires, then they have a different program than we do. So it, it's not so straightforward as our program as far as the timeline, but priority product chemical combination. And manufacturers selling tires in California would have to conduct an alternatives assessment so the manufacturers there would do an alternatives assessment and show if there are any safer alternatives to sick PPD that could be used. 
So um, I'll talk a little bit about where we are with looking at uh, 6PPD alternatives. So as I said, we are not looking at this right now um, as any sort of official program um, at Washington Ecology. We aren't looking at alternatives to try and ban 6PPD or anything because we don't have that authority. Um, but we are working with manufacturers and with, um, with automobile groups and industry groups and with NGOs and that sort of thing to try and find safer alternatives to sort of get, get the ball rolling and see, what, see what's out there. Because this is an entire class of compounds that we in the public don't really know a lot about. There's not a huge amount of literature um, on the hazards of them. Uh, as you saw in the last presentation, it's sort of an evolving, evolving research. So the, the p-phenylenediamine family of, of compounds includes 6-PPD, shown here, and the quinone form, which is toxic to fish. And there are a bunch of other PPDs that literature shows can be used in tires, tire rubber as anti ozonates um, and some of them are, we believe, currently used. They're being sold for purpose, including uh, IPPD uh, and 7PPD, and maybe this 3PPD. Um, so a little, a quick note, the number there in general corresponds to the number of carbons um, added on. So like 7PPD has seven carbons here in this little chain, and 6PPD has six, and three has three. Um, so those are a potential route we can look at. Um, there's also a lot of literature on, on other compounds and that looks at the, the effectiveness of these compounds. And this has been studied for a long time. This paper is from 1962 that looks at the concentration of additive and how it slows the rate of crack growth. Um, and there are a bunch of other compounds besides 6-PPD that in literature seem to slow crack growth to a similar extent or even to a greater extent. And some of those are listed here. Um, there's two other sort of reviews cited here. Some of the things that have been looked at include um, styronated phenol, trimethylquinoline, uh, di phenylamine derivatives, um, you've got bisphenol and monophenol derivatives, and there, there's a bunch more. But we've been talking with the industry about this and they have, it, it's not so simple as saying these, these papers show that they might work so, so that they work. Because in, in reality, it's a, it's a very, and, and we don't wanna mess with tire safety since it's, it's key to automobile safety. Um, and so we've been told that there's a lot of other considerations that they need to take into account when looking at a alternative to 6PPD. 6PPD is currently, we were told, the by far the most prevalent. Every automobile tire you see on the road has 6PPD in it. And that's because it sort of hits this sweet spot of anti ozonant properties where it has the right molecular weight, it has the right polarity, it migrates throughout the tire, so it starts inside the tire and it will migrate to the outside to help keep that pr um, protection. Um, and they, we've been warned that testing in the lab does not necessarily correlate with what happens in the real world because in the lab they use a higher ozone concentration than you find in the real world. Um, you may not be able to have the concentration you need uh, in the air. So you would, if you change the concentration of the anti then you have to change the entire makeup of the tire um, formulation. So that can change the curing, that can change the mixing. It has to be able to melt and mix well with all the rubbers. <laughs> it has to be compatible with different rubber types. Chemical supply is also something. So I guess um, told that like 6PPD has a different precursor than 7PPD. So even if we wanted to use only 7PPD, then we can't just flip a switch and 
and switch over to 7 PPD because there isn't enough 7 PPD to go around in all the tires that would be needed. And then you have the cost of, of the anti-ozonant. They, they're used at a small percentage, but if we raise the cost, that can definitely be a factor. And then last but not least is, definitely not least, is hazard. So we have all these different alternatives that are cited, but are they really any safer than CPD? And that's something we really don't know right now. Um, so like, for example, a lot of those chemicals listed on the last slide, if you may be seeing these and saying like bisphenols, monophenols, and sirenated phenols, like those are not safe compounds. So we can't just switch over to something else, even if it works without fully testing out the hazard of it. So that's where we are right now at Ecology. <laughs> We're still sort of looking at, at these potential alternatives. Um, Ecology is also looking into uh, working on green stormwater infrastructure. So this sort of um, green stormwater infrastructure has been shown to make roadway runoff non-toxic to, to coho salmon. So we would like to expand that. We also want to expand environmental sampling to sort of see how prevalent this compound is and where we really need to worry about it. And for that, we're developing an accredited method working with the EPA and uh, the Stormwater Center and um, UW. And then we want to start evaluating hazards of these potential alternatives. And so that could be looking at literature to see what is known about them. That could be doing a fish toxicity assay of these different alternatives to see if they are as toxic to coho and then also other fish too. We can't only be worried about coho here if they're going to be going into, into um, urban streams. Uh, we'd like to test tires to see what else is in them um, for, as far as other anti-ozonants, maybe create incentives for companies to find new alternatives. Um, and then we've been working with industry and public stakeholders and we will continue to do that. We've been told that the Tire industry is definitely a problem and they're working on finding a solution, but it can be up to like a 10 year uh, research cycle to sort of find <clears throat> these alternatives, confirm that they work and get them into the new tires. And that's, that's where I am. That's the, the update from the Department of Ecology and I'm happy to take any questions. Hey, thank you, Peg. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to add them to the chat. And now they're starting to come in. So before chemicals are approved for use in the USA, are impacts on wildlife usually assessed? I'm not sure about how this works. It depends on what it's being used for. So like, um, I mean, food contact stuff, a lot of these, there are some food contact rubbers, which have some anti, degradants that are approved for use in those. Uh, but I think in general, it's, they're not, is, unless you know that it will be getting into the environment and sort of, and you know that it'll be harmful, I think that um, there's not really a formal approval process there, but I, I could be wrong. Any idea of the implication for a human impact, especially turf fields with tire rubber? Yeah, that's something that we're definitely looking at, uh, and the Department of Health has expressed interest in that. Uh, six PPD, I believe, was defined by the European Chemical Association as being a reproductive hazard. So, um, yeah, that's definitely a concern. Uh, I believe most new turf fields have to have green stormwater infrastructure um, included. So. That shouldn't be a huge risk as far as the environment is, but it's definitely something we're concerned about as human impact. And there have been quite a few studies on the health impact of, of turf fields, but now we, we can sort of look at this chemical specifically. Okay, thank you. Um, someone's asking if they heard correctly 
the ability to regulate cars and car products was excluded from the safer products leg legislation? Uh, that is correct. Well, it says we are not allowed to regulate automobiles. And so exactly what that includes has, has not yet been defined and, and sort of up to the lawyers. What can municipalities do to assist your work? That's a uh, great question. Um, well, if, if you hear about any sort of alternatives, then you can help us out. Um, I think once we get this accredited method up off the ground, then it would be great to get some, some testing done and you can probably work with our environmental assessment program to help with sampling there. Um, I know there are some methods out there. Um, Eurofins has a method. So if you're interested in what sort of levels you're getting, you can, can get some, some samples assessed. Um, yeah, and then if you would, if you're interested in green stormwater infrastructure, then, then definitely look into that as well. Has street sweeping been assessed as a VMP to reduce concentrations of this pollutant? That, no, it has not been assessed as far as this, this chemical specifically. Um, since it's such a new, new chemical, we don't really know hardly anything about what, what concentrations are like in, in the water, in sort of in the environment. Um, we just know that the green stormwater does not kill fish. Once 6 PPD is in solution, how easily can it be removed and by what mechanisms? So 6 PPD is not very soluble. It's practically insoluble. Um, and that actually makes it really tough to assess, to measure the concentration of 6 PPD itself in water. Basically, all we can do now is look at the concentration of the 6 PPD quinone. So once it sort of reacts. Um, but it seems like it is, at least the 6 PPD quinone is pretty easy to remove if you pass it through the green stormwater, which is just like dirt, basically. It was sort of like a carbon filter, we'll remove it out. It likes to stick to dirt. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other current toxicity studies or evaluations from automobile products that ecology is involved in? Toxicity studies for automobile products? We have looked um, a lot at um, fluids. We have a program called Don't Drip and Drive, which looks at vehicle fluid leaks. And we've done some research into what sort of chemicals are in these vehicle fluids, or, and, um, and we funded research to do that. And then we've also looked at the toxicity of these chemicals. Um, and they've been found, a lot of these have been found in stormwater. So originally that was one of our thoughts in the last five, 10 years is maybe this toxicity is coming from vehicle fluids before we discovered it was from this tire compound. But the problem is that these, these chemicals in, in vehicle fluids, a lot of times they're in so many different things that it's really hard to pinpoint that it is because of this vehicle fluid that we're seeing this in the environment. Um, so yeah, right now we aren't working on sort of regulating any of the vehicle fluids, but we're aware that they're a possible problem and we've done some research into it, but it's not part of any of our programs right now. Did that answer the question? I think so. Okay. Um, you kind of alluded to this in um, one of your previous answers, but is there a current um, method for sampling sick PPD quinone? Yeah, we ecology do not have an accredited method. Um, you, the UW lab has quanti quantified it in some environmental samples. Um, this Eurofins company says that they have a method that works. So yes, there are methods to quantify it, um, but how, like they, they aren't accredited yet. So how reproducible they are between different labs and stuff is still, sort of unknown and, and we're working on getting that up and running and publishing our methods so that everyone can use it. What's the timeline do you think or is that known yet? I think it won't be until next year that, that we're ready for that. 
Okay. I'm not seeing any new questions in the chat yet. But it's been a great day too of Municon. There's been a lot of fantastic, another day of fantastic chats and mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been really interesting. Well, I can start to wrap up and I'll keep an eye on the chat in case anything comes. Um, Sounds good. Thanks very much, Craig, for addressing this topic today. And if you have any additional questions that might come up later on, you can find Craig's contact information in his bio on the platform. So thanks very much for attending everyone. And I hope you all had a great day today. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Abby. Thanks everyone.